Good morning to you, all of you waiting here for E Thursday that is starting a little bit earlier. Um, so I'm hoping that people got the notification when I went live and I started the countdown clock. But if you are here nice and early, um, welcome to you, E Thursday. If it's your first time here, because I've never seen the name Robin Collier. If you've never been here before, tell me where you are watching from. And I hope you're going to stay with us for the whole session. Gertrude von Rensburg, always good to see your name popping in. I haven't seen you for a while in the flesh. I mean, Jill Welsh, welcome to you all the way from across the oceans. Natasha Hose is here. Natasha, I think you're from Port Elizabeth, if I'm correct. Or Cabrera. I can't even, I still can't say it properly. The new name for Port Elizabeth. Um, and whoever else is here, please say hi in the comments. I trust you all well today and excited about the times we're living in. Um, today, I didn't really have a title for, for the message because I've got a whole lot of thoughts that I'm working on at the same time. And I didn't want to put a limit on it. Priscilla Kwan, good to see you. Okay, Natasha Hose, you are from BE. I didn't want to put a limit on put it in a box and say, this is what I'm speaking about. So I'm going to start off with my, my, some of my thoughts and we'll see where it goes. That's what E Thursdays are about. Um, if you want to get a, a teaching, point by point teaching, sometimes you can get those on the bite-sized videos, but this is more of a relaxed time of spending time together, hearing what God is saying, being encouraged and getting on with life as believers in this world we live in because we have a purpose in the world. So I want to say something. That, um, God said something to me um, the other morning that he's turning the tide. I really believe the tide is turning. Um, on the plans of the enemy, God is turning the tide and he's doing something fresh and new with his people. And we need to be ready to ride that wave. And if you heard my message on Tuesday, I spoke, I gave, I said, there's no formula for revival. Good morning, Ilana Yukurbison. I did start a little bit early, but I'm just getting into it now. Um, just starting now. Um, on, on Tuesday, I spoke about the ingredients we can have in place to be ready for revival. And, um, no, you are not late, Ilana. It is only 9.29. I am the one who was an eager beaver and I started earlier. I, I got going. I got the countdown clock going at 25 past or something. Penny Dunn, good morning to you. Okay, so if you never heard my, um, my message on Tuesday about the ingredients we can have in our lives, and they're just ideas I felt the Holy Spirit showed me, then go and find them on E-Tuesday, because I don't want to go into it again. But the main one was hunger, having a hunger for God. And I said this, in case you missed it, I said, what we do is, good morning to you, Jess, from East London. What we do as believers is we go through the motions of our lives, and we're faithful, and we do what we have to do. Um, but we do things because it's become our lifestyle. And it's the same with eating. We eat, hopefully you eat three meals a day, and you eat when it get, comes to lunchtime because you're so trained to eat at lunchtime. You, so we eat, whether we're hungry or not. But because we're trained to eat at lunchtime, we are hungry enough to eat. But if you eat a meal when you are really hungry, when, when your meal's a little bit later and you're really hungry, that meal will be the best meal you've ever eaten, even though you've eaten that same thing a couple of days before. It'll be so fantastic. And so it's the same spiritually. When we get out of the, the we do the things we need to do faithfully. We live the lifestyle. We pray. We give. We speak the word. We read the word. And we do all the things faithfully. But when we go to God, we say, God, make us hungry for more of you. We are hungry for a move of the Spirit in our lives. Then we're going to experience something that maybe we've experienced before. But 
it'll be different because God will be answering in response to our prayers. So, when God begins to move, now this is what I want to look at today. When God begins to move, the devil tries to think, think tries to make us think that God's not answering our prayers, he's not moving in our lives, he's do, only doing it with other some people, and he's forgotten about us. And so there's this sense of, I'm saying God make me hungry, but there's nothing happening. And you know, a, a big thing in your life, if you're restless, and I believe there are a lot of restless believers now, you're going through the motions, but there's a restlessness in your spirit. It's because you were made for more. And I believe the more is here. And so this, we're gonna, you're going to come across, more and more people are going to say, you say, use the same language that you are using. I feel so restless. I know there's something more. And this is a hunger that's developing in the church because God moves in response to our prayers. So one of the things that the devil loves to do, he takes that James prayer, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. He takes that and he shows believers, oh, you're not really that righteous. He, he uses the whole identity card thing and he says, you aren't righteous enough. You don't pray enough. You're not even praying properly. So why should God come and answer those prayers? Why should your prayers be effective? Because that's an answered prayer. An effective prayer is one that God has responded to. And God wants to respond to our prayers because we are righteous in Christ. So you and I, we don't have to work at being righteous. We just have to say, God, make us hungry. We, we come to you. We need you to move in our lives. That's what it's all about. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Isaiah 36. We'll go to, actually, no, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 6 first. 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, and maybe you know the story. It is, um, 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 your 2 Kings chapter 6, it is Elisha and his servant. Um, I saw some people joined in, but I'll greet you a little bit later if that's okay. So, many years, a couple of years ago, I preached a message called Stirred, Not Shaken. Yeah. You know James Bond likes his martini shaken, not stirred. If you're a James Bond fan, shaken, not stirred. But as believers in the kingdom, we are stirred by the Spirit of God, not shaken by the circumstances. That was the message. And that's been coming back to me again and again. And I know that, I know maybe you've heard reports of where God is moving around the world. In one of our churches in Australia, our churches we connected with, God has apparently begun to move there as well. Um, and, and this fire is spreading. This, and it's not really, at the moment, I haven't followed up on anything today, but at the moment we're hearing about healing and things like that happening. But um, it seems to be a move where people are just staying in the presence of God and they're worshipping Him. To me that's true revival. It's staying in his presence. It's getting filled up because we're going somewhere. And um, he's doing something in the lives of his people. And then we're going to take it out. And so if we look at um, Elisha, the prophet Elisha, he was the prophet. He's my favorite prophet. Rory loves Elijah. But I am a fan of, I love Elijah, but I'm a fan of Elisha. He's the guy who was discipled by Elijah, so he learned a lot, and then he received the double portion. You know the double portion anointing. Maybe we should look at that. 2 Kings chapter, chapter 2. I'm not going to go into it in depth, but in 2 Kings chapter 2, it's a story, of, it's Elijah when Elijah, when God was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, imagine that. Now imagine you are following this prophet. Um, he's called you to follow him. He wants, he's told you he wants to train you. And you're going to do amazing things. And then you know that this guy's going to be taken. Because I think Elijah would have already told Elisha that something supernatural was about to happen. And so Elisha stuck close to him. 
he was with him. I'm so happy to see some names coming in here who are part of the ladies' mentoring group. I'm telling you, we're going to have revival. I don't know. We're going to have to find more time. We're going to have to do something because I really feel we're getting ready for revival. That's what it's all about, getting revival ready. Um, I'll greet you a bit later. So, so there are people like Elisha who are looking for something more than they have seen before or encountered before or walked in before or experienced before. And there's a hunger in their hearts to learn from people who've been where they know that they need to go, but they know they need to go further than these people are teaching them. Because it's the Spirit of God. A person can teach you, um, some, they can teach you so much and you can learn from them, but then the people who are being trained and taught have to be people who say, Holy Spirit, here I am. I've got the information. I've heard the experience from this, this person, whoever it may be. But Holy Spirit, take me further. Because you know what we need, all of us? What we need in this season is a double portion of the anointing. And so the devil's trying to shake us on one hand and say, you can never get it. And on the other hand, the Spirit of God is saying, you can. It's yours. The Spirit of God is with you, upon you, in you, and is going to move through you. And all he needs is a, a place to land, and that's our hunger for more of him. And so, and the other things I spoke about on Tuesday, please go and listen to them. It was humility and, and hunger, humility, a fear of missing out. Um, that's a big one. And there were some other ones that I cannot remember now. So let's get on with this one. So here we find Elisha stuck so close to Elijah. And every place they went to, they go to Bethel. And then Elisha says, um, Ilana, Milneton's way too far for me. But anyway, I'll talk to you later about that. Um, Elisha said to Elijah, Elijah said to Elisha, um, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. I'm going somewhere else. It was, it was, it was, I feel whenever he said this, because Elijah said the same thing in every different place he moved on to, he said the same thing. Stay here because the Lord has told me I'm going somewhere else. But now Elisha was determined to receive everything he could from the prophet Elijah. Because he knew, I believe Elisha knew, that when he was left with the responsibility of being the prophet to the nation back here, that there would be double the opposition that Elijah faced. And you all know Elijah faced Jezebel and all the things he went through. And Elisha was going to step into his shoes. <clears throat> Elijah was the prophet who called down fire from heaven. Elijah was the prophet who stood in front of King Ahab and pronounced a drought. And then he said, the rain is coming. And Elisha knew he was going to step into this place and have to represent God, but with double the responsibility So he re because of double the opposition. So he required more than he had right there. He would have felt restlessness. I said, one of the signs that God is moving and stirring you is there's a restlessness and sometimes it's a bad thing if we, if we use that restlessness and we make things happen. But it's a good thing if we recognize we feel restless. And what we do is we pray. We go to God. We sit with God. We say, God, I'm not moving from this place until you instruct me, until I encounter you. And so <clears throat> here Elijah says to him, this is what Elisha's response was when Elijah said, stay here. He said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. So it, this was the same response everywhere. Um, so Elijah recognized something in Elisha's life. And if you go and read the, the story in, uh, it comes up here in 2 Kings chapter 4. Elisha is the one who raises the Shunammite son. We'll get back to 2 Kings 2 now. But Elisha is the one who's faced with 
A prophetic word is declared to a woman in Shunem. By this time next year, you will embrace a son. And she gets her son. A promise she thought she would never hold. Something she had given up on. But Elisha prophesied, you're going to have the son. And she did. The word came to pass. But then the son died. And this woman had the same determination to get the promise back from Elisha. And Elisha recognized that same determination. And how did he do it? If you read the story, <clears throat> if you read the story in 2 Kings chapter 4 of the Shunammite woman, when her son had died, she went looking for Elisha. She didn't want the servant. She didn't want Gehazi. She wanted Elisha. And then it, when Elisha sent the servant to go and raise the child to see what had happened, the Shunammite woman used the same words with Elisha. And she said, as the Lord lives and as my soul lives, I won't leave you. And Elisha, by hearing those words, he remembered. Those are the words that he used when he was on his journey with Elijah to receive the double portion. Because God had said to him, what is, uh, Elijah had said to him, what is it you want from me? And he said, I want a double portion of the spirit that is on you. That was his request. So there was a determination he had in his heart. There was nothing that Elijah could say. Even the sons of the prophets said to him in verse 5 of 2 Kings 2. Um, now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, now you know these are prophets and they've heard from God. Even if they were prophets in training, that's who the sons of prophets were. They said, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, yes, I know, keep silent. I don't think he said keep silent. He probably said, just shut up, I know already. I've gone this far with Elijah. He kept telling me to stay back so he could move on. And I kept saying, he kept saying, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they get to the place in chapter uh, let's read from verse five, 7, 7, 2 Kings 2 verse 7. They get to the place where Elijah is about to go. They know something is about to happen. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now, you know, the Jordan is known as a supernatural place, a place of encountering the supernatural of God. The Jordan was the river that had to be crossed over before the Israelites got into the promised land. It, was this, it wasn't the Red Sea, it was the Jordan River. But it, it was a place between where the Israelites knew what God had promised and the Jordan had to be crossed in order to get where God had said they were going. And they had a choice. And so here we find Elijah and Elisha. <clears throat> I've got frogs in my throat today. <clears throat> Sorry. Mm. I don't want to sound like a croaky old frog as I'm trying to preach to you. So <clears throat> Elijah and Elisha are standing here in front of the Jordan. And it's the same situation for Elisha because Elijah knows something's about to happen. I'm going to be taken up by a whirlwind. A chariot of fire is going to appear and I'll be out of here. But Elisha stood there knowing, this is my moment in time. God is about to do something amazing, and I want to be part of it. I've stuck with Elijah all through this journey. I've said, I'm not going to leave you. And this was his request was, he says in verse 9, Firstly, Elijah takes his mantle, rolls it up, and his mantle was what defined his identity. The prophets wore a mantle. And when the, the, the people saw the prophet come to town, they, he would have a mantle. He didn't have a halo around his head, walking around going hallelujah, or a big Bible under his arm. The mantle identified him as a prophet. So he took his prophet, or, his prophet off. Yes, he took his prophet off. Elijah took his mantle off, rolled it up, and he struck the water. And then the, it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over. So the mantle of Elijah was already off, because Elijah knew. He didn't need his mantle 
for God to know who he was. He didn't need a covering for where he was going. That mantle was going to be passed on to someone else. So he says, when they crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, ask, what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you? And I just want to stop there very quickly. Um, there are some places in the Bible where that question is given to certain people. And it's just, you know, when I talk about hunger and I talk about being restless because you were made for more, when that question comes, how are we going to answer it? Because Esther, when she stood in front of the king, he said, ask what I may do for you, even up to half my kingdom. It was an invitation or an opportunity for her to respond in her chosen moment in time. And she had to be very careful what she said, and she asked for the right thing. Then there was Bartimaeus, you know, blind Bartimaeus on the side of the road when Jesus walked past. And Jesus stopped and said, um, what is it you want me to do for you? Jesus knew that he was blind, but he gave him the opportunity to ask, what do you want? Then there was another, it was also um, the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings 4. What is it that I can do for you, Elisha says. What is it that I can do for you to repay your kindness? Here's an, an open door where people can respond to this invitation to receive what God really wants them to have. And I believe this season, you and I, as God has already begun to move, and there's this restlessness in our spirits, and we say, God, we want more. God is saying, what do you want me to do for you? And are, are we going to come to him <clears throat> with our prayer requests? Or are we going to say, God, I recognize this is an invitation because you want to give us more. You want to show us more of your presence. Give us more of your anointing. Let us see you face to face so that we can face the opposition. And it's not about, I want a bigger platform. I want to go to the nations. It's God, I want more of you. Because I feel that's our response. More of you so that we can be all you've called us to be in the season. So we're not going to be shaken by the enemy, but we're going to be stirred by the Spirit. So, it was, okay, so he says, ask what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you. Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. What an opportunity. Now, you know, we have the Holy Spirit. We're not looking for just a double portion that's on someone else's life. We already have. Jesus said, if I don't go away, then I can't send the Holy Spirit to you. He knew the Holy Spirit is the presence of the Father, the presence of God come to dwell inside of us and empower us and help us to do what we're called to do in this season where God is moving. So we're not saying, oh God, I just want a double portion of your spirit. We're saying, I want more of the Holy Spirit, as much as you can give, as much as I can handle. So he said, you have asked a hard thing. He wasn't saying it's a difficult thing for you to get the Holy Spirit. It's a difficult thing for me to give you a double portion. He was saying, do you really know what you're asking for? Because when you have a double portion of the Spirit that's on me, you're going to be required to face some opposition and to do some things. Nevertheless, in other words, he was saying, um, but if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you, but if not, it shall not be so. He was saying, if you can see what's going to happen in the supernatural realm, then you have that double portion of the Spirit. It wasn't a test or a trick question, because Elijah knew that he had trained Elisha up to see the supernatural moves of God, to see the power of God. And so he was saying, just make sure that when I'm taken away, you're aware, you're awake, you're alert, you're ready to see what's about to happen. And then you need to recognize you've got it. So he says, if you don't see it, it's not going to be, you're not going to have the double portion. So I believe there's something that you and I need to see in this season. Are we seeing 
the supernatural hand of God moving around us by faith. I'm not saying you have to see things change. You have to be out there seeing healings and doing stuff. It's in our hearts. Can we see the purpose of God in the season for his people? Can we see that God wants to move in your life and in my life more than we've seen before? Can we see that he set the church up for days like these, supernatural days? So he says, then it happened in verse 11, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly, God and his suddenlies, when you least expect it, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. <clears throat> so he saw him no more. And the first thing he did was he took hold of his clothes and tore them in two pieces. His clothing identified him. And he knew this was something different. This, was, this is going to require something else. Because now I've asked to be clothed with a mantle and double what Elijah had. So I've got to take something that, that is covering me and clothing me and tear it into pieces so that it's not my covering anymore. I, I believe a lot of people have been praying for things and trusting for things. And they, they're doing it in this old identity, the, not old, but the identity that worked before. And until we can get to the place where we can see in the supernatural what God is intending to do, and I believe it's right now, it's not five years from now, we can see this in the supernatural and we can say, God, I'm so restless, I just want to take off whatever has been covering me up until now, my old ways of thinking, my old ways of operating, and we're going to remove this to be closed with the presence of the Spirit of God. And um, so he took up the mantle of Elijah. I never intended to talk about this. And remember I started out saying, I've got a whole lot of thoughts and let's see where this goes. Um, so he, he took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Now here comes the first test. Do I have the goods to give or not? Then he took... Um, he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? It was like, God, I've been following Elijah. My request was a double portion of the Spirit that is on him. The condition for me receiving this was that I would see what was going to happen in the supernatural realm because none of those guys... The, the sons of the prophets saw anything. They were right there. They were watching. Maybe from a distance, but they were watching. But it doesn't tell me in this portion of Scripture that these guys saw a chariot of fire with horses of fire and a whirlwind that came and took Elijah away. And suddenly here is Elisha left on his own, standing in front of the Jordan, symbolic of the supernatural, holding the mantle of Elijah, who's not here anymore. And the big test is, these people are all watching. The sons of the prophets who were being trained to be prophets, prophets in training. Um, he's standing in front of them. Was he willing to take that mantle that was now his and do what he saw Elijah do before and strike the Jordan? And he did. And he says, where's the Lord God of Elijah? Lord, I want to see... You do what you did for Elijah. And so I'm going to test this. And he struck it, and the, it was divided this way and that, and, he, and Elisha crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Then they said to him, look now. There are 50 strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master. This tells me they hadn't seen what happened. Lest perhaps the spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, don't send anyone. Elisha was the only one who knew what had happened. So they urged him. And then he said, send them. Therefore, they sent 50 men and they searched for three days but did not find him. When God takes an, 
and I don't want to call Elijah an old season, but he was a previous season of the prophetic. When God changes the season and he says, I'm calling my people out to be prophetic people who carry the spirit of, of God, the anointing and the spirit of God upon them to face double opposition. There's nothing you can do to find that old season and bring it back. You can. You can go back into the old season and operate in, in the old ways. But then I don't want to do that because I don't want to be left out. And so it says, when they came back to him, for he had stayed in Jericho. He said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? It was a case of, I told you so. You know, like we like to say to somebody when they don't ask you for directions in the car and they just drive their own way and you get there, you go round and round in circles and then you, you can say, I told you so. If you ask for directions, you would have got you quicker. But this is exactly what happened. And then Elisha goes on and he performs miracles and people recognize him as the prophet who's taken over from Elijah with the double portion of the anointing. So I, I, would say, I first said, let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. So let's go there. 2 Kings chapter 6 from verse 8 is Elisha again. Now, I believe when, I said this at the beginning of the session, when God starts to move, the enemy is going to move with a counter move to try and shake us off what God wants to do. Um, the enemy's been moving all the time, but it's just become more and more blatant. One of the things I like to watch every year, there are a few things. I like to watch the Oscar Awards, the Academy Awards, but for the past few years, it's just become a whole lot of nonsense. It's, it's, it's just become unnecessary. It's like they're trying to bring the world system into my world and your world. They're trying to make it normal for transgender people to be in movies and and you, you know what I'm talking about. It's just normal. And the other thing I like to watch are the Grammy Awards. Um, I don't listen to all that music, but I just like to see. I don't even care who wins an award. I just like to see what happens there. So I sat down the other night to watch the Grammy Awards. And it's just, it's like, I mean, the song, I just, I got to a certain point where I just put the TV off. I might watch it a bit at some other time because it's um the the song that won for the best pop duo is called unholy never heard the song before because i don't listen to that kind of music unholy and so i know the person who wrote the song and who performed the song is a man who doesn't know what he is anymore because you can't call him he or she. You have to call him they. Okay, so there's already a whole lot of confusion there. But then I saw these people, this man, and a very pretty blonde lady, lady in high heels, go up to the stage, and the lady was the one to do the speaking first, and she said, I'm so happy to receive this award because um, I'm the first transgender female to receive an award. And I was like, what? I, I thought you were just a normal, pretty woman. And I saw the crowd all going, yay, and clapping their hands and applauding. And I thought, this is the world today where, and this has been going on for a long time, but this is the world today that we are facing with people who have kids at school who are facing this stuff that is normal to them and acceptable and applauded. And you and I in the kingdom have a totally different way of living and 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 we don't want to judge them as people but we can't condone what what happens and what they do and so this is just one of the areas that's trying to come in and hit us in the face and we are people who say but this is not the kingdom of god these are the ways of the world we have to you know we have to stand our ground it's like standing in front of the jordan <laughs> God, where's my mantle? What am I going to do with this thing now? And we have to continually 
separate ourselves to the ways of God to say, God, we need more of you. Because we can't go out there and hold up placards and say, we disagree with this and we, you know, because that's not going to help because the world is already deceived. So they see things according to the, the enemy's agenda and it's all normal. And you and I in the kingdom, as people who, who only stand up for the ways of God, are classed as irrelevant in today's society. We are judgmental. We are not loving people. Because we, we decide we're going to go with the ways of God. And I'm telling you, when we do that, we are going to see, just as Elisha saw the double portion of the Spirit come upon him, and he struck that Jordan River in two, and he stepped into the supernatural, and he put on the mantle of Elijah, and he walked in a double portion, and people began to recognize that on him. And he didn't have to go around, he didn't have to put posts up on the biblical Facebook, if there was one, to say, I'm now, Eli I've taken over from Elijah, for any queries, contact this number dot com. He just had to walk in the anointing that he knew he had. And so I believe God is releasing an anointing for you and I, so we'll be stirred by the Spirit of God and not shaken by what we see. And, you know, I used to pray that one day I'd be able to go to the Academy Awards. I didn't pray about it. I, it was, I, I didn't say, oh, please, Lord. I just said, Lord, I'd love to go to the Academy Awards. I don't want to go anymore. I don't want to see my children go to the, uh, I shouldn't say this, maybe it would be a good thing for a Christian to be at the Grammys and to, there are Christians there. Here's the strange thing. There are Christians who are planted in, in, in Hollywood and in the music industry. I know. They're in the music industry to shake that stuff, for the presence of God to come into those places. Now, this is what I want to see. Um, so, let's get to 2 Kings chapter 6, and then I'm going to finish. This is the story of um, the blinded Syrians. Now, the king of Syria, from verse 8, was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down here. What happened was, the prophet heard what the king was saying in his bedroom. This is what a double portion does. When the enemy is planning to come against you, this is what the Spirit of God does. When the enemy is planning to come against you, when the enemy is trying to take what you're praying and say it's never going to work, when the enemy says you don't have a purpose in this life because you're irrelevant, it's like, the prophet hearing the words of the enemy spoken in his bedroom and then going to warn the king, saying, don't go there because they've already planned to come against you. So whatever the enemy's trying to plan against God's people, God already has his spirit out all over the place, speaking into our ears, saying, rather go this way. You will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. I'll go before you and make the crooked places straight. All the mountains will melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. All those obstacles are already being taken care of if we will just be listening to the voice of the Spirit in this season. And then, so, in verse 12, none of his, one of his servants said, not, like he, the king was saying, who's against me? Who's telling my secrets to the king of Israel? That every time I make a plan, this doesn't happen. That it doesn't happen because my secrets are being revealed. And then some, he said, one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. This is the reputation that you and I have in the realm of the spirit. If we are going to be people who pray, you know, intercession is where prophets are developed. Intercession. I'm not saying because you intercede you're going to become a prophet. But if you're a prophet and you intercede, this is where you pick up the heart of the Father. This is where you learn to go with the flow of the Spirit of God in intercession. This is where you learn to only say what is on the heart of God and not your own ideas. Because if you someone is going to say, Lord, I want to be used in intercession, this is the heart of God. This is where he, he shares his secrets with people. This is where he shows his people things that are going to happen before they happen. 
So I believe prophets are developed in times of intercession. You have to, because a prophet isn't just someone who gets a whole lot of information, a little bit of revelation out of the word, and then stands up and speaks on behalf of God. A prophet has to know the heart of God, and where does that develop in intercession? So I'll talk about that more some other time. But so Elisha, um, it says here, he said, go and see where he is that I may send and get him. He wanted to get a hold of this guy so that his secrets wouldn't be shared with, with the king of Israel. Um, and he, it was told him, saying, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Do you really think he said that? Alas, my master. Now this was the servant. This wasn't the prophet. He gets up in the morning to make some coffee for Elisha. And he decides to go out and see what the weather's going to be like for the day. And then he looks out and he sees a whole army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. This is what a double portion anointing did for Elisha. They didn't just send one or two men. They sent a whole army with horses and chariots to get one man who knew the secrets of the king. This is what a threat he was. This is what a threat you become when you are willing to get into the presence of God and hear the secrets of what the enemy wants to do and you pray those things through before you declare it as a prophetic word. So he, I'm sure he didn't look around and say, Alas, my master, what shall he do? There were probably some choice words that came out of his mouth. What the hell are we going to do now? Because he didn't have the, the double portion of anointing. He was serving Elisha. He was carrying his bags. So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. This is what I believe the prophets will be doing in this season. For the people who haven't seen the supernatural things in the... And this is what I'm going to pray for you now as we finish. This is important that God's people see what God sees. Or we're going to be overwhelmed by what we see at the Grammy Awards, at what's happening in the schools, at the crime reports, at the economy reports. We're going to be overwhelmed by that. And we need to realize we are people who carry the Spirit of God with us in this season. And we're still going to experience more and more an outpouring of the Spirit of God like never before. And one of the main reasons is to overcome the opposition because the enemy is going to try and shut it down. And so Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm not finished, but I'm going to pray for you. Lord, I pray for every single person right here, right now, in myself included, that you would open our eyes that we may see. That there's, there are prayers that we're praying. Family situations would be turned around. Healing needs to come. Financial breakthrough needs to come. Um, a change in our communities, a change in the schools, a change in families, a change in government in our, in our country, in the other nations represented here, changes in government, that your kingdom will come. And Lord, I pray, open our eyes that we may see, that we'll not see the, the enemy surrounding us, but we'll see you in the midst of whatever's going on, in Jesus' name. And then it says, Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now remember, Elisha had seen Elijah taken away by a chariot of fire and horses of fire. And here it was again, the same chariot, but not one, chariots, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around them. I would have loved to have been there that day. I would have loved to have been the servant of Elisha that day. Don't even have to be Elisha. But to stand there and say, see this. Where what you've seen before is opposition and a threat. And suddenly you see beyond that into the spiritual realm. That's more alive than what we see in the natural. 
the, the, <clears throat> why do you think that, the, that God says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much? This is, this is a good example of it. El Elisha prayed an effective, fervent prayer. And it wasn't, you know, half an hour on his knees. You know, what we do is we, we get on our knees and we begin to beg and plead God. It was just a declaration. Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And he had an opportunity to see how big God was, the army of God around him. Now, this is what we need to see. Then we will be people. Uh, let, let me do this first. So when the Syrians came down to him, the army actually came down. Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray with blindness. This is what happens with the anointing on someone's life. Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of the Lord. And then Elisha led them to Samaria. Okay. So, and then it says in verse 23, it says, The bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. If you were in the armies, uh, in the army, the enemy's army in these days, and this guy prayed a prayer, strike them blind, and the whole, all of you were, couldn't see anymore. I wouldn't want to go back into that place again. Now this is you and I. In the kingdom of God, with the authority we have on, in Christ, to pray and see into the supernatural realm, where we see they are more with us than with the enemy. We're surrounded by a wall of fire. God promises in his word, I think it's Zechariah 9, I will be a wall of fire around her and the glory in her midst. If we could just see that that is our environment, in the middle of this dark place, this is who we are. We are God's people. We are members of the kingdom of God. We have the spirit of God with us. We are not governed by what we see in the natural but we remember, I just prayed a prayer that God would open our eyes so we would see into the realm of the Spirit. That's who we are today. So, we are not people who are shaken by the opposition, but we stirred by the Spirit of God. Does that make sense to you? Let me give you one more scripture. It's Psalm 16, verse 8. Listen to this. I've actually got three scriptures. I'm going to, I'm going to read you these three scriptures. Because I said at the beginning of the session, God is turning the tide on the plans of the enemy, trying to overtake, overwhelm, overcome God's people. And he's turning the tide. And the reason I know that is there are scriptures in the Bible where God promised this long ago. And if we are people who say, yes, God, you're opening my eyes to see in, in the, into the spiritual realm, we're going to believe these promises. And the first one is Psalm 16, verse 8, and it's in the Passion Translation. And it says this, Because you are close to me and always available, my confidence will never be shaken, for I experience your wraparound present every moment. Your wraparound presence. I heard wraparound, wrap, and I thought present. No. So I'll read it again. Because you are close to me and always available, my confidence will never be shaken, for I experience your wraparound presence every moment. Isn't that amazing? I like that one. Yes, Isaiah 54 verse 17 says this, No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that rises up against you in judgment you shall condemn. You shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Remember, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Their righteousness is from me. And that, when it says here, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, it's not just something we inherited. It means this is the assignment of the servants of the Lord. This is our assignment today to... Condemn every tongue that rises up against us in judgment. And you know what that means? Every lie of the enemy that is speaking a word of condemnation or judgment over you, saying, you can't pray properly, you don't know what you're doing. We condemn those things. We take authority over those things 
And we command those lies to be silent. Just as Elisha said, Lord, he, he prayed blindness on those guys. He spoke blindness on those guys. Isaiah 59 verse 19 says this. Um, I love it when I come here with my notes and then I don't use my notes at all. I'm just using these last scriptures. Um, Isaiah 59 verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord. Then from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. That's a good one. The spirit of the Lord has already lifted up a standard against the enemy. That's you and I. We are the standard. We are his banner. We are the jewels in his crown. We are the ones who is holding him. He's holding us by the right hand saying, Fear not. I'm with you. I will. I will. I will. So I trust you were encouraged today. Um, let me see if there's anything here in my notes that might... Okay, let me have a look. I do have something in here. I was going to look at Isaiah 36, but I'm going to look at that next week, maybe. Um, in this book, Your Now Season, I wrote a chapter called The Resilient Prophets. And the word resilience is this. This is what we have in our spiritual DNA. The capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. Toughness, the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape or elasticity. So in other words, you're not going to be pressed out of shape. If you see what God sees, if you believe that when I prayed that prayer, God opened your eyes to see they are more with us than with the enemy. You're going to have resilience. You're going to be able to Bounce back into the shape God intended you to be, and you're not going to be squeezed out of shape. Um, so there was something in this that I wanted to read. Um, about pr resilient prophets. They will have a deeper understanding. Because they have been through the turbulence of the threats of the enemy to silence their voice. To make them second guess their calling and purpose. And they've come out in the shape that God intended them to be. That's you and I. Shaped as arrows in the hand of God. They will have a word of hope and vision to declare. Because they have grown tired of being silent in the cave of hiding away out of fear. We are not designed to live in the cave. Um... God is blowing the cobwebs out of those hiding places and he is lifting the lid off the boxes people have been kept in. Be resilient in the season and find the shape God intends you to be molded into. It's a shape that looked like Jesus when he walked the earth. Don't let the enemy bend you out of shape. You have resilience in your spiritual DNA. There will be a fresh anointing spilling out of prophetic people because there is more to be accomplished. Increased encounters. Now, as I read this, I want you to receive this by faith. Increased encounters, dreams and visions, times of acceleration, accelerated harvest are all part of the new season. God is going to turn the plans of the enemy upside down as the resilient ones step into position. That's what it's all about. So... We are, gonna, we are headed for some exciting, powerful times. And it all starts with saying, God, I'm hungry for you. I want more of you. I want to see what you see. Instead of seeing all the stuff going on around us and hearing the voice of the enemy all the time, we are designed to see what God sees. So let me see who's here. Pietro Pelé, good to see you. Werner Skippel, good to see you. Werner, I see you tagged Danica, Skippel, and Charles Plout. I don't know, Werner, if you're the one I met on Monday night. If you are, please give me a thumbs up in the comments. I won't see it if you just give me a thumbs up. It's good to have you here. Um, Corin Stradorm, good to see you. Taryn King de Vries, Belinda de Haan, Edna Klingen, also good to see you too. Um, I saw some other names. Joining you, a lot of people. Sandra Martin. 
a lot of people, I say, Sandra, Martin, it's good to see you. A lot of people are, um, may have left already. Geshom and Lovu, welcome to you. Renee Hope, nice to see you. Michelle Cravenstein. Uh, I saw. I think I saw me, Megan Hope arrive. Renee Ibe, always good. Yeah, new wines, skin for new wine, exactly. Grace Joy, Jennifer Gallard, um, Jillian Miles, welcome to you. Um, Ilana, I'll talk to you. Maria Boven from Sweden, always welcome to the Swedes. Um, Vanessa Salias, nice to see you. It was good to have you on Saturday. Janine von Skalkvek, what a blessing. Um, Scott Cut Bobby is here. Melanie Clark, Megan Hope, there you are. Nice to see you. Kurt Diedrich, and there are some other names. But I'll greet you all later. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, now I've got a whole message that I never preached because I felt I needed to do what the Holy Spirit wanted me to speak about. I remember. You carry an anointing from God. You're called for days like these, supernatural days. And you are called and designed to see what God sees. So I pray that prayer. You receive it by faith. Don't be shaken by your circumstances. We are not James Bond. We are stirred by the Spirit of God. We don't drink martinis. We are just stirred by the Spirit, not shaken by the enemy. So be encouraged with that today. Go and wait with God. Say, God, make me hungry for more of you. That's the key. Hungry for more of you because God is turning the tide and we're going to be ready to ride that way. So have a fantastic Thursday. I had to think which day it was. Have a fantastic Thursday. I'll see you tomorrow with a bite-sized video. And if you come in to connect on Saturday, Rory and I are ministering together, Connect Church on Saturday morning. All you have to do, no cost, you just have to email kathymull at gmail.com and be there by 9.30 for a whole morning of prophetic ministry, so teaching and ministry. So I love you, I appreciate you in my life, and I'll see you soon again. Bye. Thanks for joining today's session. I hope you were equipped, empowered, and encouraged today by what you heard. Remember, you can find all the live video sessions that you may have missed on this page, on the Facebook page, Kathy Mole Ministries, or on YouTube, Kathy Mole on YouTube. You can also find all the other resources on kathymole.com. Thank you.